Well, Lloyd George may have been, as Lord Morgan has been outlining, one of Britain's most eminent and successful statesmen of, of the 20th century, but few chances can have been faced with a more alarming fiscal prospect on taking office. At a time when Britain's total central government expenditure was only £151 million, he was faced with a deficit for the next year, 1909 to 1910, that was variously estimated at being being between 15 and 18 million pounds, so 10% more uh, on the very best estimates. The People's Budget, um, a phrase actually stolen from the uh, mid-19th century radical Richard Cobden, was Lloyd George's solution to this dire situation. Now, it was clear from the start that cutting government expenditure was not a realistic possibility. The main causes of the fiscal black hole were firstly uh, declining revenues because of an economic downturn. Secondly, the rising cost of the Navy. £2.8 million had to be provided for four new dreadnoughts. And above all, the new scheme of old age pensions, £8.5 million. Uh, as Lord Morgan said, the, uh, the costing of this um, programme had left something to be desired. Lloyd George couldn't do anything about the first of these issues and it would have been political suicide to have tried to substantially cut either expenditure on the Navy or the expenditure on old age pensions. Borrowing in peacetime to balance the budget was anathema to everyone in politics and considered the road to national financial ruin. The Liberals had anyway heavily criticised the Conservatives for borrowing even to pay for the Boer War of 1899 to 1902. That meant the 1909 budget would have to be a taxing budget. The only question was who would be taxed and how. Well, no Liberal government could contemplate new taxes on imports, as they were, of course, committed to free trade, while tariffs was associated with their, their Conservative opponents. That meant the di that direct taxes would have to pay, uh, play an enormous role in meeting the deficit. Here, Lloyd George's path had already been laid out for him by his Liberal predecessors. The historic difficulty about raising income tax was that, even though there were some abatements that could be claimed by those earning from the threshold of £160 per annum, that's about the income of a kind of white-collar worker, a sort of clerk, up to about £700, there was only one basic rate of income tax, and this applied to all forms of income. So increases could press quite hard on those with modest salaries. And when people in this era talk about you know, reaching the limit of taxation, this is really what they're talking about. Increasingly, Liberals had come to see this as inequitable and that the key test of fairness should be ability to bear taxation, not a uniform rate. The wealthy wouldn't miss a few pennies on direct taxation, while the struggling clerk or tradesman might have to go without some of the necessities of life. This principle had already been enshrined in Liberal budgets. Uh, in 1894, Sir William Harcourt had graduated death duties to ensure bigger estates paid higher rates of tax. And in 1907, Asquith had not only created different rates for earned and unearned income, he'd reduced income tax on earned incomes under £2,000 to ninepence in the pound, while retaining the general rate of a shilling in the pound for earned incomes above £2,000. Lloyd George just pushed these principles much further in order to meet the deficit. In 1909, income tax was graduated all the way up from ninepence in the pound for those on earned incomes under £2,000 per annum, all the way up to one shilling and eightpence, that's of course more than double, uh, for those with incomes over £5,000 per annum, if you add in the, the, the sixpence super tax. Death duty rates were pushed up so that the estates of £5,000 paid 4%, while those over a million paid the, the giddy rate of 15%. These increases in direct taxation were estimated to provide the largest sum towards meeting the budget deficit, £6.3 uh, million. Pounds. Lloyd George intended that most of the 1.2 million or so income taxpayers who earned less 
than the £2,000 per annum would see no increase in taxation at all. And the heaviest burden would be carried by the small group of people who earned over £5,000 per annum. And there may have been as few as um, 11,500 of them. But he had no illusions about the intense opposition these proposal would, would face from the Conservatives and the need to justify them in public debate. In particular, Lloyd George had to face the argument that higher taxes on the wealthy would harm the whole economy by appropriating capital that was desperately needed for investment. Now he tackled this problem in, in all sorts of ways, but most importantly he practiced a kind of prodigious sleight of hand by, very successfully, doing everything he could to distract attention from the rises in income tax and death duty and focusing the spotlight of debate on the land taxes. Now, originally, Lloyd George had concentrated on trying to have a simple penny-in-the-pound annual tax on the capital value of land worth over £50 per acre. But he couldn't get this through the Cabinet, um, who were very worried about the impact on agricultural land and small property owners, let alone any attempt to override existing contracts for occupiers to pay all taxes. So instead, what Lloyd George ended up with was three rather involved land taxes. It's sometimes said there were four, but the fourth one was actually a, a tax on mineral royalties, so it's not really a, a, a land tax at all. So the three taxes were a 20% duty on the increment in a land's value whenever it changed hands. Secondly, a 10% duty on the benefit to a landowner at the end of a lease. And finally, an annual halfpenny in the pound tax on the value of undeveloped land, apart from agricultural land, which was exempted. Now, as Lord Morgan has said, these taxes were never intended to raise much money. Uh, Lloyd George suggested only half a million pounds, perhaps, in 1909 to 10, and to collect this money, uh, it would involve the gigantic task of valuing all the land in the United Kingdom, a proceeding that was still un incomplete in 1914, that was by that time employing a staggering 5,000 people, some of them on a part-time basis, admittedly, and it had cost over £2 million. But by emphasising the significance of the land taxes in Parliament and in some of his most famous speeches, Lloyd George created the actually entirely misleading impression that most of the new taxes on wealth were actually taxes on land. An impression, of course, that was only confirmed by the virulent Conservative denunciation of the land taxes and the rejection of the budget in November 1909 by the landlord-dominated House of Lords. This strategy invigorated Liberals, most of whom disliked landowners intensely, after all, most of them were implacable Tories, and reassured wealthy businessmen in the Liberal ranks. But it also made it easier for Lloyd George to claim he wasn't actually attacking capital as such, only the unproductive elements within it, because, of course, landowners' accumulations of wealth had not been earned and were dissipated in lavish consumption. Landowners merely sat back while others who rented or leased their land increased its value. Uh, the famous unearned increment, or that's the popular understanding, I think, of the phrase, that was mentioned so much on political platforms in 1909 and 1910. This strategy was extended by yoking the land taxes with new duties on licences to make and sell alcohol. Now, these were expected to make a big contribution to meeting the budget deficit, about 2.6 million. But, of course, they also ranged temperance enthusiasts behind the budget and could be justified as an assault on another unproductive fraction of capital, the drink industry, which, it could be claimed, merely made workers less efficient, or drunk, if you like, and diverted their spending from other, more useful products. Landowners and the alcohol trade were essentially defined as parasitic upon the rest of production and suitable targets for fiscal persecution. And in fact, of course, the whole liberal strategy is to differentiate between different types of wealth and hammer home the message that they're not hostile to all capital, just some parts of it. Much of the rest of the deficit was met by fairly traditional forms of tinkering. Um, £3 million was raised by raiding the sinking fund, 
though uh, the Liberals kept firm hold of one element of traditional fiscal prudence by continuing to redeem the national debt at a much higher rate than their Conservative predecessors had done. And in fact, the national debt fell from 755 million in 1905 to 650 million in 1914. Pity the First World War came along to spoil it all. Um, stamp duties, of course, increased um, to bring in another £650,000. So it's interesting that um, Lloyd George eventually decided not to increase stamps on bills of exchange on the grounds that this would harm the City of London too much. Finally, £3.5 million was to be raised by increases in tobacco and spirits taxes. Uh, not beer, spirits. Um, an old standby for hard-pressed chancellors, but also, I think, a policy that allowed Lloyd George to suggest he'd retained the traditional idea that all classes should contribute to national taxation. Because, of course, those who earned under the income tax threshold, which is virtually all working-class people, uh, would also pay those indirect taxes when they purchased um, tobacco or spirits. Though pointedly, Lloyd George did not reverse the cuts in duties on tea and sugar that Asquith had made when Chancellor. So the working class contribution to national taxation now came almost entirely through what were defined as luxuries rather than necessities. So the proposals in the 1909 budget were both a way of meeting the fiscal crisis of that year and a strategy for justifying the methods Lloyd George had chosen to raise taxation. And in both senses, the budget was a success. Despite national expenditure continuing to rise to 198 million in 1913-1914, no new taxes were needed until the 1914 budget. Almost all of Lloyd George's new taxes proved successful in the sense of raising revenue, um, contributing 27.2 million pounds to the budget by 1913-1914. The one exception, of course, as Lord Morgan has pointed out, um, were the land taxes, which in total by 1913-14 had only raised £613,000, much less, of course, than the £2 million cost of the still uncompleted land valuation. And the major difficulty had turned out to be a series of court cases, I and mean, there's a whole series of them between 1911 and 1914, whose adverse judgments had, by, no, by the summer of 1914, totally suspended the collection of undeveloped land duty and partially suspended the collection of the other two duties. But on the other hand, of course, the land taxes had been a spectacular political success. They'd rallied the Liberal Party, forced the Conservatives to fight in defence of land ownership rather than all wealth, and played a major role in the House of Lords' decision to reject the budget and the Liberals' victory at the January 1910 election. I think in those circumstances, uh, Lloyd George probably didn't mind too much the inconvenience that they hadn't actually raised very much money. Thank you.